So science fiction fandom of the time, public interest was going up towards a peak for science fiction. Uh, you started to see a lot on television. You started to see a lot of movies, and it was starting to peak. That would happen about 1955, after which people started to get more into westerns. But science fiction was hitting a peak right now. And in the United States, we had a number of television programs that were available for science fiction, mostly for kids. So, for example, Captain Video, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, uh, Space Patrol, which is the way they always did it. Space Patrol. Rod Brown of the Rocket Rangers. Flash Gordon, which is one weird little animal. That Flash Gordon series was produced in Germany and France, I think by people who were not native English speakers. It is so weird. Go search on YouTube for like 1950s Flash Gordon. There's a lot of episodes out there. It's a very strange animal. It just comes off as a little bit wrong because you're listening to people who probably were not native English speakers. <laughs> a very, very weird deal. We also had, for children as well, Captain Zero with a Z-R-O. You've probably seen it going past on my slideshow. And, of course, the, and ev the uh, wonderful Adventures of Superman uh, that will occasionally pop up on anything there. Then for adults, there wasn't much at that time. We were going to see some more stuff coming along in a few years, within the next couple to three years. But the big one at that time was a show called Tales of Tomorrow. It was an anthology show. They would take a science fiction uh, you know, piece, do one story this week, the next week a totally unrelated story, unrelated characters, etc. That was an anthology series. That meant that they were going from one to the next to the next. Now, in terms of films, oh man, 1953 was big for films. Um, again, we were entering this period where science fiction was becoming much more popular in films and pop culture. And we saw some good ones, and we saw a lot of bad ones. There is an author, science fiction author, Norm Spinrad. I'm sorry, not Norm Spinrad. Um, it's Ted Sturgeon. And he came up with what we call Sturgeon's Law which is 90% of science fiction is crap. And there is a corollary to this. 90% of everything is crap. And I think that's probably true. Just look what's coming out now out of Hollywood. 90% of everything is crap. But we did have some interesting stuff here. We had War of the Worlds. That was a really good movie. There it is, War of the Worlds. Great, great movie to come out of that period. But we also had crap like Abbott and Costello go to Mars, Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Catwomen of the Moon, Donovan's Brain, The Four-Sided Triangle, which I have watched and it's pretty terrible, Invaders from Mars, It Came from Outer Space, which at least is noteworthy to some extent, uh, Phantom from Space, Planet Outlaws, which was adapted. It was a it was an edited down version of the first Flash Gordon serials from the 1930s. Project Moonbase, Rocket Monster, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Magnetic Monster, The Neanderthal Man, and one that just absolutely stumps me. I may have to watch it just because of what it is. Twonky. Where the hell does a title like Twonky come from? You see it going through here from time to time on the slideshow. Twonky? Where does that come from? <laughs> I have no idea what it is or what it's about. There it is, Twonky. I, I'm going to have to maybe watch that sucker just to find out what it is. However, a discerning science fiction fan knew that most of this stuff, at least 90% or more, was crap. And they knew going into it that maybe the best they could do would be to get some enjoyment out of it by, you know, pointing and laughing. You know, kind of like what we do with some of the bad movies we see today. You know, and like The Room or something like that. You go into it knowing it's crap. But the best science fiction of the era was occurring in literature. And this was the heyday of the pulp magazine. Now, they called them pulps because when you make paper, what you do is essentially you're pulping a tree. You're turning it into paper. At that time, there were different types of paper, whether you had really good paper, really bad paper, and the bad paper was used with uh, trees that had not been pulped all that well. The 
uh, paper was really cheap, which allowed these pulp magazines to come out and people could afford them with a very, very low amount of money. There was a lot of pulp magazines for every kind of, uh, of genre, but certainly science fiction. Oh my God, certainly science fiction. As you can see here, these are just the titles that I could easily look up that were out there for science fiction. And they all these all were going on in 1953. So each of these guys, 12 issues. 12 issues each of these guys. And it wasn't their first year, and it wouldn't be the last. This was the height. Oh, by the way, look at that. Look at that one. See that one with the uh, Statue of Liberty sticking out? That was a piece of art from 1953. 1953. And what does that remind you of from 1968? I should probably stop that one if I can. That astonishes me. When I found that, I found that several years ago, and I went, there is nothing new under the sun. That sucker is exactly like the end of Planet of the Apes. It almost looks like it, down to how it's drawn. It looks like Planet of the Apes. Nothing new under the sun. Watch it as it goes around again on the slideshow. Just take one look. It is so similar to the end of Planet of the Apes. I was just amazed. It wasn't the first time I'd seen it. I actually went looking for that one because I'd seen it before. I just wasn't sure of the year. But 1953, that's when it came out. And 1968, we see the, almost the exact same thing in Planet of the Apes. I wonder where Rod Serling may have come up with that particular notion. Now, Pulps, there it is, there it is, there it is, looks exactly like Planet of the Apes, exactly like it. Uh, chairs sliding down again, bothering me. Uh, yes, Larry, those Pulp magazines are now brown and brittle if they survive. Well, you can see what I'm looking here, it's, it's, it's you know, some of these scans or or. Photo photographs of stuff. A lot of it showed up on um, shows up on eBay and stuff like that. But there were so many of them. There were tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, and again, all of these titles. These are individual titles. I did not. I intentionally made sure I did not double any of the titles. And they were going twelve months, one issue every month. And what often happened was this is where science fiction novels were born. What they would do is they would get an author and they would serialize their story. They would show, like, one month they would have a chapter, second month another chapter, third month another chapter, and they would go on until they hit the end of the story. And if it sold well, if it sold well in the pulps, then the author could take that, turn it into a real novel, maybe do a little bit of editing just to make it make sense, turn it into, there it is again, maybe turn it into a novel and then sell it to a publisher to be published. And Pulps also had short stories, lots and lots of short stories, and also novellas, which were short novels that were not um, serialized. But this was a period during some of which almost all of the people we now think of as the science fiction greats came out of, literary science fiction greats. They included names, and this is not an exhaustive list. It is a long list, but not an exhaustive list of all those authors who came out during that time period, people we still consider giants today, like Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, Jerry Pornell, Frederick Pohl, Paul Anderson, Ted Sturgeon, Jerry Soule, Ray Bradbury, H. Beam Piper, Harry Harrison, L. Sprague de Camp, Robert Silverberg, Jerome Bixby, A. E. Van Vogt, and Lee Brackett, by the way, whose name is on as one of the writers for The Empire Strikes Back. And then also L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, he's probably not one of the greats in terms of science fiction, although he has written a bunch of novels and a bunch of stories. I've read a few. They're pretty mediocre. But when you know that L. Ron Hubbard was originally a science fiction author, kind of makes sense that his religion sounds a lot like science fiction. Now, even Harlan Ellison in the late period of the Pulps was, was writing for them, and this is where his pseudonym comes from. Harlan Ellison was big on nobody touching his words. If an editor thought it needed to be written some, rewritten some way, Ellison did it. Later, when he got in TV, 
if he was writing for something and he wanted his words, to, and the, some producer said, no, you got to change this, you got to change that, Ellison would do it. If somebody else did it, and if they messed with it enough that he felt that it was no longer the vision that he was trying to get, he would put his pen name on it as a signal to science fiction fans everywhere that this thing sucks, as far as he's concerned. Was, I'm washing my hands of this by putting my pseudonym on. And his pseudonym was Cordwainer Bird. So if you ever see Cordwainer Bird, that's him saying, not my fault, washing my hands of this whole thing. And he almost put it on Star Trek story, which is arguably, I say, that this episode is the one that in future, uh, you know, 200 years hence, when they're looking back and doing film history courses, Harlan Ellison's episode would be the one, if no other, the one that will be shown. And if you don't uh, do anything else in terms of ever watching original series Star Trek, watch this. It is called The City on the Edge of Forever. And it's a little bit more approachable to modern fans because it doesn't have very much going on on the ship. So you don't have to worry about what now looks like kind of hokey special effects and all that. Because at the time, they were state-of-the-art. But it isn't, there isn't much of the Enterprise. There isn't much of anything. It's a period piece that takes place in the 1930s. A very brilliant episode, no matter who rewrote it. And watch that episode. If you do not watch anything else in Star Trek, the original series, watch The City on the Edge of Forever. Your brain and your heart will love you for the rest of your life. It is probably Star Trek's best episode ever. But Harlan Ellison almost put Cord Wayner Bird on that because a number of people rewrote that. He was convinced not to. But if he had, it would have been a blow to Star Trek, which was trying to court those literary science fiction fans. They were saying, look at us. We're doing the very first adult science fiction that is going to be a continuing story about continuing characters and is going to be intelligent. And they were largely right I mean, look at Star Trek's um, competition at the time. Lost in space? It's not exactly intelligent science fiction. Uh, an actor named John Glenn played a doctor in this, yeah. Uh, 1930s on the back lot. Yes, absolutely. That's what they did. They did a 1930s piece on the studio back lot, and it is a brilliant episode. If you watch nothing else of Star Trek, the original series, watch The City on the Edge of Forever. Your brain and your heart will love you for the rest of your life. You will. I guarantee you will get invested in this story, and by the end, you will get the feels. I still get the feels. I have watched this thing now for 53 years, and I still get the feels on that one. And that list that I gave you is only a short number. All these magazines had to be filled. You know, 30, 50 pages had to be filled with stories. Some of the greats that we're talking about here, Isaac Asimov, for example, he went under the pen name Paul French for a while when he was writing what were called juveniles, that is, stories and novels intended for juveniles. Maybe not. Usually his stories were pretty damned good, but they were not aimed necessarily at adults but juveniles, so they're bringing more adult science fiction into a period where juveniles could be reading them, and he used Paul French for that. And other authors would do the same thing. If they were doing a story that didn't make it into one of the big pulps, you know, astounding stories, stuff like that, those were the big ones that everybody really uh, had a lot of respect for. If he wasn't putting it in there, they might go to a pseudonym and use it on some other lesser-known magazine. So, Yes, Twilight Zone had, as Larry says, the first adult science fiction stories on TV. The thing about Star Trek was it was the first time we had a continuing characters. Science, uh, a Twilight Zone was brilliant, don't get me wrong, but it was an, an anthology show. It was, okay, we're doing an unconnected story this week, next week we do a different unconnected story, etc. It was a brilliant show, and it was very adult-oriented, but Star Trek was different in as much as we're talking about the same characters week to week to week. So... Um, now, in terms of the fans, because the fans were still active, it's not, it was not like today where we had the internet, but we had our own stuff to do, and this, continued, this was all the way from the 1920s, mid-1920s, all the way up until basically when we started to get computers in the 1980s and 1990s. And the biggest thing that we had were fanzines. 
These were very interesting animals. They, uh, they started out all the way back in the 1920s and continued uninterrupted all the way into the 1980s, late 1980s. And what you would do is much like what we see today. Fans doing their own artwork, fans doing their own stories, fans reviewing things that had come out, movies and TV shows, reviewing them. Now, you didn't have websites to put that on. And you didn't have anywhere to put your fanfic, which they did a lot. So what we would do, I was involved in this on the tail end of it, what we would do is take our stuff. If you wrote something that you thought was any good, or any, it didn't even necessarily have to be any good. Look at this one, the Kelvin Outpost, right? Watch that as it comes around again. That's not uh, circa 1950s. That's circa mid-70s, early 80s. And that was a fanzine put out by Starbase Andromeda which still exists. It is Lincoln, Nebraska, where I live. It's longest-running Star Trek and science fiction uh, fan club. Still exists. People still meet there. And the Kelvin Outpost was our fanzine. I think there was three episodes, or three issues, maybe four that ever got printed. But what you did was, uh, real quick on my chat, most of the rockets in 1950s sci-fi looked like the German V2 rockets. Yeah, yeah, well, you always have to place this against the context of the time. When they were thinking about spacecraft, they were thinking about rockets. And they did tend to look like V-2 rockets because that's the sort of tech you were working off of in 1953. Like right there. So what we would do is you would come up with a story or make some artwork and you would get them together, put them all together in a sort of magazine style and then bind them typically with staples. And then you would usually sell them to people in your local fan club because there were fan clubs all over the place. Or if you were really lucky, you might somebody in a fan club might know somebody who would be interested in buying them, and then you would sell them off to those guys. And if you were really, really lucky, you would go to a convention. Science fiction conventions predate Star Trek conventions and any other sub-conventions that's associated with a single TV series. And they still do today. There are flat-out science fiction conventions that have been around forever. Worldcon, for example, has been around forever. And so you might go to a convention, and then you might be able to sell these to other people at conventions, or you might just swap them. The thing about fanzines was you didn't necessarily make any money from them. What you really hoped was you were going to make enough money to cover the cost of making the thing in the first place, but you didn't necessarily make a ton of money. One of the more interesting things, however, is sometimes this work was really, really good. It's Sturgeon's Law, always held. 90% of it was crap. But some of the stuff that was really good was really, really good. And some of those, uh, some of those writers, they would be honing their craft inside these fanzines to the point where they said, hey, maybe I can try selling some of these to the pulps. And sometimes they did. And they would cross over as uh, out of the amateur range into the professional writer range. And in point of fact, one of the oldest science fiction fan clubs in existence, the New York Futurians, had an enormous impact on science fiction for decades. A lot of the people who started out there went on to become writers and editors that are part of that list that I rattled off. They came out of the New York Futurians, and they had an enormous impact on science fiction for decades to come. So the other thing about these was sometimes you had newsletters. You can see one that passes through here from time to time. I'll uh, glance over and see if maybe it's going to show up in the slideshow. Didn't David Gerald have stories in fanzines? I'm not sure. Um, his first professional sale, obviously, was uh, Trouble with Triples. There, there, there it is. That's the Science Fiction Times was a newsletter. It's part of a fanzine that they did. And there's the Kelvin Outpost, ours. Um, if he had stories in fanzines, I don't know about it. He may well have. He may well have. He was, you know, intending to become a writer. So he may well have. But again, a lot of those guys honed their craft in a place like a fanzine, not necessarily seeing a very broad, you know, market for it. But they were honing their craft to the point where they could then become and move into the professional arena. So the biggest thing about this was we did not have no computers. 
computer was the size of a warehouse and it had less computing power than what you have in your pocket. You have more computing power today in your pocket, in your cell phone, in your smartphone than it took to put man on the moon. So it, we didn't have computers. We didn't have printers. We didn't have Xerox machines. So how do we make these things? Well, we made them with mimeograph machines, often called ditto machines, because that was the major manufacturer in the United States. We called them ditto machines. I'm going to have to do something about this thing. Maybe I'll have to see if I can fix it or get another chair. Uh, anyway, we had ditto machines, and that's how we made these things. Now, ditto machines are nasty, weird little animals. What you had to do with the ditto machine was you would take a special kind of paper and put it in your typewriter. And the typewriter was usually manual typewriters. Uh, adding machines, yes, we had adding machines, um, devices that um, I can't even describe them. They're not computerized at all. They are mechanical, and I can't even describe it. Uh, advanced mathematics was done with slide rules. I won't go into that either. Be glad you didn't live through that period. But if you were doing any level of advanced mathematics, you were using a slide rule to get your calculations. But ditto machines. Oh, these little monsters. I had to live through the tail end of the ditto machine era. So, for example, if your teacher wanted to give out an exam, they might use a ditto machine. The other thing they might do is just write the questions on the blackboard with chalk. That would often happen in a uh, quiz. But if they wanted to give you a, uh, a test, an exam, an actual exam, they might use a ditto machine. So the way this worked was you took your special paper, put it into your typewriter, and typed it all out. And if you made a mistake anywhere in it, you pulled out the paper and threw it in the circular file and started over. Which is why for a long, long time, and even during the time when I was in high school, typing was a skill. Because you had to be able to spell correctly. You had to be able to get it right the first time every time. Now, if you're on regular paper, there were some things you could do. But if you wanted it to look professional, you got it right every time, the first time. And then speed was an issue. Interesting thing. I can type now at roughly 80 words per minute. But I never learned how to type. I learned by hunting and pecking. I now type, and I have for decades, with these four fingers. My mom, who knows typing, who has typing as a skill, um, is absolutely sort of flabbergasted and almost annoyed at the fact that I can do 80 words per minute with just these two fingers on each hand. I'll tell you, however, it has saved me from carpal tunnel syndrome uh, because I'm moving my hands all the time over the keyboard as opposed to keeping them in one specific place and just moving them, which is what a typist would do. That's how you get the carpal tunnel. I've been saved by that because I just move all over the place. So being in a career in IT for 40 years, that's actually been better for me in terms of my uh, ability to avoid things like carpal tunnel. But it does sort of infuriate my mom when she sees me doing it. Just <laughs> two fingers on each hand. Uh, Larry says, or the teacher would say to correct the mistake on your copy. Yep. You had to be able to spell. You had to be able to uh, type so that you got it right every time, the very first time. And if you screwed up, the teacher would say you had to correct it. This is why we used to do drafts of things. Um, you would do a first draft, second draft, and then the thing. You might do an outline and all that. And that was so you would get to a point where you had something. You knew exactly what we were going to type, and you typed it out right the first time. These days, I don't know what they teach in school, but me personally, I haven't thought in terms of drafts in decades. Ever since I got a word processor in 1978, I uh, have never thought about drafts. I just write what I want, and then I realize, oh, I could do this better. I could do that better. And a number of things have kind of honed me to the point where I can do some English and do real writing. Larry says, key punch typists were in demand for punching those IBM punch cards. Yeah, computers at the time didn't necessarily have the inputs that we imagine today. You know, we're used to having a keyboard and a screen and a mouse. No, 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 no. You wrote your program, and then the program was turned into punch cards. And then you fed these cards, they're cards about this wide, this high. And they would be filled with little punched out parts in it. And then you would feed those in succession in the correct order 
into the computer. My ex lived through the tail end of that. Fortunately, I did not. Um, with punch cards, you could get a box full of them, and they would re represent a fairly, today, simplistic program. But if you got those punch cards out of order, you know, say you picked up your box out of the trunk of your car to take over to have them fed in the computer, and you dropped it, and all of your punch cards fell out of order, you got to put them all back in the correct order, or else your program would not run. Yeah. Oh, were cards based on the size of the dollar bill? I did not know that. I didn't know that. Doesn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, that's about the size they were, about the size of a dollar bill. And they had little punched out holes in them that represented your, um, your uh, program. And that's why, as Larry says, you had key punch typists who would l to take your English type, a computer programming language, and turn it into these punched cards. That was a computer back then. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing like the amount of computing power in your hand and the ability to do things that were totally impossible in that period. Anyway, on the fanzines, you typed all this up, you finally got it right the first time around on your uh, mimeograph paper, and then you wrapped it around this drum that we can see here. You wrapped it around the drum, and oftentimes you would hand crank it at first. Later on, they did get mechanical, I remember that. But you would hand crank it, and you would have paper that would then go from the front edge of that drum. You can kind of see it where she's standing. There's paper there. You would roll this drum, and it would spit out a copy. The copy was not in regular uh, ink. The copy was in a blue ink. And that ink stunk like mad. Um, when I was in high school, as I say, I lived through the tail end of this. When I was in high school, sometimes if you had a period that had nothing, you know, that you couldn't, that nobody could fit any real class into, they would say, hey, do you want to be uh, the assistant to like the drama teacher? I was once for one uh, semester. You want to be assistant to the drama teacher? I'd say, sure. Now, typically that was an automatic A. Unless you were a complete frack up, the uh, drama teacher would just give you an A. But, or anybody, anybody you were doing. But I certainly remember, you know, come in for that, and he'd say, here, uh, here's a, uh, here's a, you know, ditto. Go make 30 copies of this. And so I'd go down to the teacher's lounge. And as Larry Larry says, you'd use a well-ventilated room. Well, not all the time. In my high school, the teacher's lounge stunk of this uh, uh, d ditto uh, ink. Just terrible. Um, should have fumigated the place. <laughs> And that is how you made copies. And the way science fiction fans did their, their uh, fanzines was they would either, sort of like I would do, and I was in the tail end of it, um, either get permission or not to uh, slip in and use the mimeograph machine when nobody else was using it to make your own copies. And that's how people made fanzines back then. Now... Um, you could always find these in schools, you could find them in churches, and sometimes they were cool about you using it, sometimes not, and you'd use guerrilla warfare and go in there and make the copies when nobody was looking, hopefully. And that, my friends, was the state of science fiction fandom at the time. You had mimeograph machines and all of this stuff going on because we simply didn't have the technology that we have today. We just didn't have it. And so they did the best they fracking could. So that is the life of the era. That is the fandom of the era. That's taken me an hour and 12 minutes to go through just to tell you this is how life was back then. If you were a fan, if you were somebody who was watching science fiction on television at that time, that was the world for you. You have to remember, this is totally different world in many ways, a completely different world than we see today. And that's how you have to come at this film. You cannot look at it from 2018. You have to put yourself back in time so that you know what was happening and what was going on and what the technology was so that you can look at this and say, okay, now I can judge it as a viewer of the time. I can't judge it as a 2018 viewer. I will come up with, this looks stupid and fake and hokey. Hokey, and how can anybody ever think this is any good? You have to look at it from the period of time. Uh, Larry says, I used to, I worked in an architect office which uh, used machines to copy blueprints and about the same smell. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm sure. One of the other things, interesting things about it, as an offshoot, your nose was ruined. Oh, God, yeah. I just remember doing it that semester, and it was a horrible stench. And that's where the teachers hung out when they had uh, free periods. <laughs> I am amazed that some of them didn't get brain damage from having to smell that stuff. The other interesting thing about that was um, it led to some interesting stuff in fandom. Now, in fandom today, we always have our jokes. We always have our memes and things like that. They didn't have memes back then, but they had jokes, lots of jokes about this, that, or the other thing. Sometime in the 1920s or 1930s, the New York Futurians, a couple of them, came up with this joke. I have no idea what the joke was or where it came from, but it does stick with science fiction to some extent today. They came up with a god of science fiction who was called Gu, G-H-U. Now, this was not a real god. Nobody ever thought of this. This was a joke. But it stuck. And part of the reason it stuck is because of this ink used by these digital machines. It was purple. And when you were making copies, you would often get your fingers purple. And so they came up with this god, Goo, and over time they said, hey, Goo's holy colors must be purple because of this ink. So sometimes, not very frequently, but occasionally, you will hear me say something like, what the Goo is that? Or, you know, or by Goo's holy fingers, or by Goo's holy purple robes, as sort of a, uh, an oath, an infection. Um, simply because I don't like swearing if I can avoid it. Um, if I'm going to swear, if I'm going to use the seven deadly words that Carlin, George Carlin said you cannot use on television, which, by the way, are shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits, those are the deadly seven. Those are the ones that will warp your mind, twist your soul, and keep America from winning the war. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. If you hear me using those words, it's because I want everybody to understand what the frack I'm saying. Otherwise, I tend to use science fictional words. And so occasionally, very occasionally, I will swear by goo. Most often, you'll hear me use frack, garam, things like that. Uh, royal blue paper. Yeah, it, the ink was kind of royal blue, but it looked sort of purple. And so that's why it's stuck with that. Most of the time, you'll hear me using fictional curse words. And part of that is intentional. Anyone can say, and eh, everybody does now say, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Anybody can say that. It requires absolutely no creativity to say the seven deadly words. It takes creativity to curse interestingly. And I'm enough of an intellectual purist that I like to be able to say, hey, I can do it with a little more creativity. So you'll hear me use words that are fictional science fiction words for uh, curse words. Yup, that's, that's when Carlin turned blue in his comedy. Yeah, um, the seven deadly words piece, if you, see, if you hear the first one, that was very controversial at the time. They couldn't play it on the radio. A uh, few places did and risked getting in trouble with the FCC for the, uh, for the language. But, yeah, he goes over several times. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Uh, he did go on to uh, enlarge the list greatly, but don't worry about that. Find the one where he actually goes through. It's the seven deadly words. Look at that one. That's a hell of a lot funnier. Yep, and that's when Carlin grew his long hair, he got a beard, etc. Pretty much turned into the sort of guy that we see today, or saw before his, uh, before, his, before his death, before he left us.